This circuit board has two tracers on it, a short straight one and a long squiggly one. They're connected in parallel, so have the same voltage across them, giving both an equal opportunity to lure electrons down their respective paths. If we connect a power supply across the circuit board and use it to force 10 amps through the two paths, we'd naturally expect the current to take the shorter path. Looking through the thermal camera, we can see that, indeed, the short trace is getting hotter because a greater proportion of the electricity is choosing that path, the path of least resistance. However, if we now swap the power supply for this rather pixelated circuit, we can see something quite unexpected happening. The long trace is now heating up, while the short trace remains pretty much stone cold. The electricity is now choosing to follow the long path. You might have noticed both of the connections to this board are at the bottom, but the traces stop at the top. So how does the current get back down? Well, as is very common, that happens on the back side of the PCB. In this case, I fucked up my design and had to add this bodge wire in. But don't worry about that, it doesn't affect any of what we're looking at today. Clearly, this wire follows the long squiggly trace on top, but as it's the return path for all the current from both the traces, it doesn't really matter where it is or how long it is, because the current's got no choice but to flow through it. Right? Well, that is true in the case of a constant direct current, but things become a bit weird if our current changes, and it's all to do with magnetic fields. All conductors produce a magnetic field when a current flows through them. If a conductor is all alone, far away from any magnetic or current-carrying materials, a large uniform field can form around it. However, if, as is often the case, there's another conductor carrying the same current in the opposite direction nearby, the two magnetic fields will mostly cancel each other out, with only a small resultant field remaining. A conductor with a bigger magnetic field has more inductance, which is essentially electrical inertia, limiting how fast the current can change. A large field or high inductance is like a lorry, it takes a long time to speed up and slow down, while a small field or low inductance is like a mini, its speed or current can be changed much faster. So while resistance limits how much current can flow for a given voltage, inductance limits how fast a current can change for a given voltage. This effect is easiest to see with a voltage square wave, Here's one I made earlier. The current of a purely resistive load simply follows the shape of the voltage waveform, and its amplitude is determined by the resistance. As we can see from these RMS measurements, 10 volts divided by the resistance of 10 ohms gives a current of 1 amp. If we add a bit of inductance to the load, then the current almost follows the voltage, but takes a little bit of time to catch up after a sudden change, because the rate at which it can vary is now limited by that inductance. We can see that limit from the scope's slope measurement, which tells us that, at the steepest part of this curve, the current is increasing at 2 amps per microsecond. If we divide the voltage by the inductance, what do we get? 2 million amps per second, aka 2 amps per microsecond. If we add a lot more inductance, the current can't even reach its steady state value before the voltage changes, and the waveform becomes triangular with its amplitude no longer determined by the resistance, but instead by the inductance. When this is the case, increasing the frequency also reduces the current, as there's less time for it to change and try to catch up with the voltage. Thankfully, all this confusing rate of change stuff can be wrapped up into a single quantity called reactance, which is like resistance, but tells us how much the current will be limited by the inductance at a given frequency. Reactance is simply the inductance multiplied by the frequency, and then multiplied by 2 pi, because circles. Ultimately, the current is determined by a combination of the resistance and the reactance, known as the impedance, which can be calculated using simple Pythagoras. It's probably now pretty obvious what this mystery circuit is, and if we peel off the pixelation, we can see it's a 1 MHz high current source. That's a lot of hertz. No wonder things are behaving unexpectedly. We can see the current this circuit's putting into the board using a fancy probe called a Rogowski coil, which reveals a triangular waveform with a frequency of 1 MHz and an RMS value of about 6.5 amps. All of the PCBs shown in this video, including the one used in the current source, are from JLC PCB, who offer many features that can help with the issues we're looking at. 
such as thin PCBs and numerous multi-layer stack-up options to reduce inductance between layers, extra thick copper, now up to 4.5 ounce per square foot, to reduce resistance, and of course, gold plating for sex appeal. Their matte black solder mask is also quite handy, not only of your Batman, but also if you want to easily measure the temperature of the tracers on your board, as it has a good emissivity. Ordering from JLC PCB is as simple as dragging and dropping your Gerber files onto their website and selecting whichever of the plentiful options take your fancy. So, check out JLC PCB using the link below. We're close to solving this mystery now. All we need is some evidence in the form of inductance and resistance measurements of each path. So, let's start with the inductance. For this, we're going to use a fancy piece of kit called a Vector Network Analyzer, specifically the Bode 100 from Omicron Lab, which is a relatively low-cost VNA that's absolutely brilliant for teaching concepts like component parasitics and control stuff. Using this impedance adapter, the equivalent parameters of through-hole components like capacitors and inductors can be measured, and we can even use it with our board. Here we can see at a measurement frequency of 1 MHz, the short path is showing an inductance of 230 nanohenry, while for the long path it's just 70. This is because, as we saw earlier on the whiteboard, if the conductor carrying the return current is close to the one carrying the forward current, the magnetic fields mostly cancel each other out. So even though this path is more than 50% longer, it has a much smaller magnetic field as the return path is just one millimeter away, on the other side of the PCB. When it comes to measuring resistance, this fixture isn't meant for such low values, so the readings it gives aren't really reliable, as we can see from a gentle jiggle. My money don't jiggle, jiggle, it falls. Instead, to find the resistances of the two paths, we can use the power supply from earlier to force 10 amps through each, one at a time, and we can then measure the voltage drop using an accurate multimeter. This gives us a resistance of 10 milliohms for the short path and 36 milliohms for the long path. Now that we have both the resistance and inductance of each path, we can calculate the impedance at any frequency, and here's a plot of just that. When the frequency is low, the impedance is dominated by the resistance, which is lower for the short path. When the frequency is high, things flip around, and the long path actually has the lower impedance, because it's now dominated by the reactance, and the long path has less inductance. We can see at the 1 MHz frequency of the current source, the short and long paths have impedances of 1.44 and 0.44 ohms respectively. No wonder the current is choosing the latter. I think our mystery has been solved. So, to summarise, electricity follows the path of least impedance, not resistance. They just happen to be the same thing for DC. The short path has less resistance because it's shorter, but the long path has less inductance because the return current follows it closely, cancelling out its magnetic field. When the frequency is low, or zero in the case of DC, the impedance is dominated by the resistance, so the easier path for the electricity to take is the short one. However, when the frequency is high, the effects of the inductance become dominant, making the longer path the easier option. But why is any of this relevant? This is just a demo board with a short straight trace and a long squiggly one, not exactly representative of real circuits. Or is it? Well, in many applications, inductance needs to be kept as low as possible, and it's often more important to minimise than resistance. One example is the commutation loop of a power converter, but I've covered that to death in previous videos, so let's instead look at a problem that has the potential to impact not only this circuit, but even other unrelated circuits nearby. EMI, or electromagnetic interference. We have here what's known as a H-field probe, used for measuring magnetic fields radiating out of circuits. We've got three high-frequency amps flowing through the short path, and if I turn on channel 1, we can see the magnetic field picked up by our probe. Now let's switch over to the long path, which, remember, has forward and return currents much closer together. Wow, that's a big difference. The reason the H-field probe is a loop is because that's the best shape for picking up magnetic fields. It's also the best shape for radiating them, which is exactly what the large loop of the short path is doing. Its magnetic field is beaming out into the environment and coupling into our probe like two windings of a transformer. It's dreadful, 
Clearly, keeping the current loop small is important not only to improve the performance of the circuit, but also to reduce any negative effects it may have on other circuits. Now you might be thinking, I don't need to worry about any of this because I use ground planes in my designs so that I don't need to think about routing return paths as the whole board is the return path. Well, that is indeed why ground planes are ubiquitous in high performance designs as they allow traces to be routed without too much consideration for the current loop as the return current always has a nice low inductance path through the ground plane following the forward path. To test this, here's a board with a single straight trace on top and a nice fat ground plane on the bottom. Connecting this board to the current source, we can see that the radiated magnetic field is indeed very weak. Try to ignore all these spikes and ringing in case you couldn't tell my H-field probe isn't exactly professional standard and does pick up some crap. When designing a PCB, it's often difficult to resist the urge to route just a few traces on that nice clear layer of the board. Let's add a cut into the board to represent a rogue trace slicing up our ground plane. This actually has a little effect on the EMI, and we can use the Bode 100 to compare inductance, which also sees little change. This is because the return current is naturally drawn towards the forward current. Like us, the electricity wants to minimise the inductance. Unfortunately, this effect can only help so much. If we extend this trace to the top of the board, the return current now has no choice but to deviate from the path of the forward current on the other side of the board, creating a dreaded current loop. Dun, dun, dun. Oh, the impact of this small change is quite dramatic. Extending our fake trace by a few millimetres has increased the strength of the radiated magnetic field by ten times. Our board is completely ruined! So, on that positive note, what's the takeaway from this video? It's important to think beyond the intuitive world of DC and consider the AC effects of not only inductance, but also capacitance, which I'll probably eventually get around to covering in a future video. While it may seem logical to make every current path on a PCB as short as possible, it's extremely important to consider where that current is coming from and where it's going, to think about its entire journey, not just a small portion of it. It's often the case that while making a current path longer may introduce additional losses in that particular part of the circuit, the benefits to the overall system allow those losses to be made up for and more in other areas. Without wanting to sound overly grandiose, it's all about the big picture. Anyway, that's the end of this little picture on your screen. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time, bye!